En un momento, comenzaremos con la interpretación para otros idiomas además del inglés. Cuando empecemos con la interpretación, verá aparecer una opción de interpretación en la parte inferior de la pantalla para un sitio web o aplicación de escritorio. Cuando esto aparezca, haga clic en Interpretación y seleccione su idioma favorito. Para dispositivos móviles, haga clic en los tres puntos de la esquina superior de su pantalla, luego seleccione Interpretación y luego seleccione su idioma. Una vez que comience la interpretación, comenzará a escuchar la presentación en el idioma que seleccionó. Через несколько минут мы начнем устный перевод на языки, отличные от английского языка. Когда мы начнем перевод, в нижней части экрана появится опция «Перевод» для веб-сайта и настольного приложения. Когда эта опция появится, нажмите «Перевод» и выберите предпочитаемый вами язык. В случае использования мобильного устройства нажмите на три точки в верхнем углу экрана. Затем нажмите «Перевод» и выберите свой язык. Сразу, как только переводчики начнут переводить, вы начнете слушать презентацию на выбранном вами языке. بعد قليل سنبدأ الترجمة إلى لغات أخرى غير الإنجليزية. عندما نبدأ في الترجمة الفورية، سترى خيار تفسير يظهر في الجزء السفلي من شاشتك لتطبيق موقع ويب سطح مكتب. عندما يظهر هذا، انقر فوق ترجمة وحدد لغتك المفضلة. بالنسبة للأجهزة المحمولة، ستنقر على النقاط الثلاثة في الزاوية العلوية من شاشتك، ثم حدد ترجمة الفورية واختر لغتك. بمجرد بدء الترجمة الفورية، ستبدأ في سماع العرض التقديمي باللغة التي حددتها. كيف بوندي تتأنزا تفسير يا لغة زيدية كينجريزا؟ وقاتي تنبوانزا تفسير، وتأونا تفسير كما أشجوزي، وتكاوني كانا كوني تشيني يا سكريني. كاتو فوتي أو ديكستوب أب. وتكابونا هي بونيزا تفسير، نوشجوي لغة ونايو بندليا. Kwa wale wanaotumia simu utabonyeza vidoti vitatu kwenye kona ya juu ya skrini. Halafu chagua utafsiri na uchague lugha yako. Mara ukalimali utakapoanza utaanza kusikia mada ikiwasilishwa katika lugha uliyochagua. Hicho tojen kie chini chini ugo ngan kajini ugo roko tajini kajini english inam ila ne chini ugo Kuna jelo na ano interpretation ni mene jelo walo gulo tulang tatay screen yung am inam ng ay walo minin kapchibir mene mene ba interpretation inam kailat kajin yung am ngan roro kajaro bala kajaro bala talo mo na gua table na gua kuna jelo chulo piriya na gua mura ipello ko na ay tulang tatay screen yung am inam kuna chibir minin inam chibir interpretation inam kailat kajin yung am ng ay jeno ugo in a moment, we will begin interpretation for languages other than English. When we start interpretation, you will see an interpretation option appear on the bottom of your screen for a website or desktop app. When this appears, click interpretation and select your preferred language. For mobile devices, you will click the three dots in the top corner of your screen. Then select Interpretation and select your language. Once interpretation begins, you will begin to hear the presentation in the language you selected. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for our third community learning session. This evening, we will focus on our Pacific Islander population. We have some great guests here and great students that will be sharing with you. I'd like to uh, present to some and introduce the others, our administrators from the school district that are here with us this evening. Christy Perry, superintendent. Sylvia McDaniel, director of communications. Sandri, Sandra Price, Wendy Roberts, Rob Schofer,
and I believe I got everybody. Thank you all for being here today to join us. It's my pleasure now to turn this over to Chair Avila from our Salem Kaiser School Board. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Uh, good evening, buenas tardes everybody. Uh, really appreciate and honored that you're all here tonight to join us uh, to listen and learn um, with our special guests. You know, it's uh, our community learning session focusing tonight on our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities in Oregon. You know, the community learning sessions is a learning opportunity for various topics, connecting our communities to the board and the, our district in a manner that can help build bridges provide exposure and awareness of critical topics, uh, shifting from a school board, a school centered culture to a community centered culture that would benefit, that can benefit um, our students, our families, um, our board members and educators. We hope to bring topics uh, that bring light to the systems or policies that create barriers to our communities through understanding and knowledge, which helps tra create transformation in those systems and policies that empower our youth and our communities for overall success. I'm really pleased and honored to be able to engage in this learning and engagement process uh, with fellow board members that may be in attendance with us, um, district staff, uh, those who took the time to help put this uh, community learning session together, or a special shout out to you all, I really appreciate it, um, to our community, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and to our guests tonight. I encourage you to ask questions, listen, um, and then ultimately complete our survey. Let us know what topics you may would be interested in learning more about. Um, now I am honored to introduce uh, Kathleen Jonathan uh, to introduce our guest. Kathleen. Thank you, Chair Vila. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here uh, and welcome. I am part of the panel along with Dr. Sandy Suneyoshi. She's the former director of Asian and Pacific Islander American Student Services at Oregon State University. She is um, a retired, uh, she's retired and has been involved in the work around equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm happy that she's also joining the panelists. Uh, the panel tonight. Uh, along with Dr. Suneyoshi is Dini Moses Mesubed, who is the, um, she's a board member of the Copa Alliance National Network and is the Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Columbia Basin College. Uh, thank you. So this evening, our uh, guests will be able to uh, ask questions. If you will look at your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. You'll use that button to submit your question to our panel. We have Wendy Roberts and Rob Schofer that will be monitoring that for us and making sure that we get those answers to you. Now Kathleen will share with us. So tonight, um, this month, month of May is, as we all know, it's the American Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And tonight we will focus our um, listening session on Pacific Islands. To use the term Pacific Island is, is, is such a broad term. And in that category, there are so many island nations um, in the Pacific, and there's the Republic of the Marshall Islands, um, Federated States of Micronesia, Republic of Palau, Kiribati, Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, and these are there's within these island nations there's more so many languages and dialects, um, cultures might be similar, but there's a lot of uh, differences as well, and for me as a native Marshallese, I will be focusing on the Marshall Islands 
and um, my colleagues will um, elaborate more on um, some of the other island nations under that category. So I just wanted to share this, this map. And if you look, the islands are tiny dots. You see Marshall Islands is located way up in the middle. It is the first country west of the dateline. And they are 19 hours ahead of us in Oregon. So it is a, um, a Tuesday. It's Tuesday the 17th already. And it's about two hours in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, Marshall Islands is one of three island nations that um, share what's called a treaty with the United States government. And that treaty um, allows the people from the Republic of the Marshall Islands, people from the Republic of Palau, people from the Federated States of Micronesia to come to the United States with a passport. You don't need a visa. Um, along with that passport, it's what they hold a uh, arrival departure document, which is called the I-94. And you can work as an islander from these three island nations, you can work. Um, you can, there's no expiration date. When you come, you just have to renew your passport, it depends on what island nation you're from. But you, uh, as soon as you get here, you're able to get a US social security number. You can work without a visa. You can work without having to fill out for an employment authorization card. But for folks that these island nations, you know, a lot of things are learned orally. So documents are not always seen as important. Some of the, a lot of the people will lose their I-94 and it used to be $160. If you lost your I-94, you would have to pay for it. And it went from 160 to uh, 200, 230. Um, I think it's no 320 and then now it's around 440 445 it's a it's a lot of money to a lot of the families because they work in labor jobs now that's the geography piece just a little bit of it and i want to leave some for um beanie and sandy to also talk about um some of the island nations that they will cover um then the um, marshall yeah. oh go ahead Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought that no, was no, no. Go ahead, Bini. Um, can you go back um, to the yeah? Um, I wanted to add that um, the Pacific Island is um, often termed as Oceania, as you see from the map, and it is broken down into three geographic locations, which is Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. So islands such as Hawaii. Tonga, Samoa, um, those would be considered as uh, Polynesian. Um, and so if you, you, a lot of people will consider them the South Pacific, and then Micronesia is the North Pacific. Um, and so Micronesia, which is Palau is where I come from, um, is part of what Kathleen talked about regarding the Compact of Free Association um, generally, and then there's Melanesia, which um, is a component of Papua New Guinea. Um, it's uh, New Guinea um, and some other um, islands around the Australia and um, the North South. I'm trying to figure out if I can. Um, it's east or west, uh, west, yeah, of the Pacific. So generally, Pacific Islanders from Oceania are a very diverse population, as Kathleen shared. We have different ethnic backgrounds, cultural practices and traditions, various beliefs, languages, and as well as other uh, customs. Oftentimes, we actually speak English to each other in order to understand, kind of communicate with each other. Um, Although we share um, some uh, background in terms of imperialism and colonialism, um, we have very unique experiences in how we've been impacted by colonialism 
um, in Polynesia as well as Micronesia especially. And, and I talk about that because I often tell my students when I work with them that, you know, unlike Native Americans who kind of experience imposter syndrome in classrooms and also um, oftentimes in their histories, they were taken away from their families and that a lot of their cultures were punishable if they were speaking their language. That this didn't necessarily happen to us, but that idea of being westernized was very much embedded into um, our school systems and how we were we navigate how we were conditioned to to feel like um, our ethnic cultures and our backgrounds was something that we had to leave behind in order to become somebody that's considered worthwhile, successful, and um, and someone who's considered um, validated in in um, in American standards. So we would find kids who often try to like really work on their accents to make sure that they don't have an accent. I mean, I was I would share with my with my students as I do some of this is I I grew up, I didn't really understand what it meant to see let's say like don't stay under the sun too long, you might get dark. And I didn't realize how kind of the un unconscious ways of how racism was embedded in our colonial history, that it also played a part in us realizing that we didn't belong to some sort of like this, this Western type of, of system. <clears throat> um, you know, we face various unique challenges from generational trauma to anxiety also felt by our children who are first generation immigrants to also students who are having issues with cultural identities. And as I mentioned, imposter syndrome with American life uh, and also generations of trauma from colonialization and a lot of push and pull between family, what's expected and how we want to hold on to uh, many of our cultural practices that are very important to us. But often we are um, conflicted because what we're taught is somehow to have to like um, erase, like that sense of erasure in order to be validated as uh, as people, right? And so a lot of students struggle with some of that. Um, our cultures are different also in that, uh, in the Micronesian Islands, for example, and Kathleen will talk a little bit more about the Marshall Islands, but Palau as well has a very strong matrilineal society. So there are different ways that men and women work together. And also um, that plays a part in, in family structures. Some Polynesian islands have a monarchy system <clears throat> um, and some are, are affiliated to different types of UN superpowers. You know, some are connected to the US, others are connected to France, England. Um, <clears throat> and so places like Hawaii obviously is a US state. And so they're US citizens, they have certain types of benefits right as uh, as part of the states but they also struggle with indigenous challenges within which sandy is going to talk about um, and people from guam and northern marianas are u.s citizens but they have limited access to resources and services in the u.s in fact if they chose to um to be voters in the u.s they lose their right to vote for their governor in their own islands uh, <clears throat> People from um, Palau and, uh, and Marshalls and, the, and Micronesia, we're not necessarily US citizens, but we have a unique treaty that allows us to live, work and stay in the US for unlimited time. And even though we actually learn about our treaties before we get there, so we are very well versed about it, um, oftentimes we come to the US and find out that nobody knows about our situation. And that most of the time, people think that um, we don't really, there's no such thing as a, a COFA treaty. Um, I oftentimes actually in higher ed, work with students all over the nation who would email me because they know that I work in higher ed and say, can you please write a letter on my behalf? I'm now facing student conduct because they think I'm lying for applying for federal financial aid or that when you walk into an office 
and you oftentimes you share your, you know, and there's a sense of if this is not the reality I know, then that's not, then what you're telling me might not, is not true. And so our students are already like scared and stressed as they're trying to navigate whether they can even trust the system because there's constant sense of imposter syndrome that they're experiencing. Um, and then specifically New Zealand and Fiji, to name a few, they have to use a visa as international students to enter the US. So those are just some of the examples of kind of the, the vast differences and the diverse types of Pacific Islanders um, that, we're, that we have to, or statuses that we have in coming to the US. Um, I can pass it back to Kathleen if you want to talk about the Marshall Islands specifically, and then I'll go back to kind of giving you kind of a, a general picture. Thank you, Beanie. And it looks like Sandy's here. Um, just a reminder that we have our interpreters interpreting on the line. So um, just keep in mind as we're sharing information, maybe talking a little bit slower. Yes, I can. Okay. But I'm I trying think we to. Be good. If I have any problems or if something's not working, I'll call you. Um, so, moving on to just, I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about the Marshall Islands and how um, the treaties came to be. Right after World War II, um, the Federated States of Micronesia, Palau, and Marshall Islands. Uh, were became what was called the trust territory of the Pacific Islands. And um, the United States government saw um, the Marshall Islands as a place where they could test the atomic bombs um, right after the war. And so they used two of the islands. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So to take note of two of the atolls, sorry, these are, are uh, the Marshall Islands consist of atolls. The difference between an atoll and an island, an island is, is a piece of land in the middle of the ocean. And then atoll, it used to be an active volcano. Over time, that volcano sank, became dormant, and you know the mouth as you can see uh they look like there's what there's blue and then there's like circular lines that used to be the mouth of the volcano and the body of water inside those circular looking you know things that's called the lagoon and outside is the ocean so all of these atolls in the marshall islands used to be volcanoes it used to be an active um, spot at one time. Not all of them are atolls. I think five of the islands are actual islands. They're not atolls. So take a look to the, to the top left. There's two atolls on the very left part. One's called Wudilang, the other one's Aniwitak. Okay, take note of that, Aniwitak Atoll. If you go further to the right, you'll see Bikini Atoll at the top north of the rally chains. The Marshall Islands have like two sets of island chains that are almost parallel to each other. One's called Ratak chain and the other one's called rally chain. So the one to the farther right is Ratak chain. Ratak means um, sun is rising. Ralik means sun is setting. So that's where they got their name from. Bikini Atoll is very famous for um, where the United States military tested the atomic bomb. And Aniwetak is also famous because that's where they stored all the nuclear waste from um, back when they tested. There were over 60 atomic bombs that were tested in the Marshall Islands. This is the famous, um, it's called the it's from Operations Crossroads, Crossroads Baker. It's the famous um, atomic bomb. And as you can see, and I don't claim any, I don't claim any um, name to the photos. I just use them as visuals to help 
in explaining um, the history of the Marshall Islands and that's related to the US military and its testing of the atomic bombs. So this was, um, they did evacuate the, the people of Bikini and move them. They were, for a long time, they didn't really have a place to stay, even though they're Marshallese. Uh, people from the other atolls didn't really, I'm not sure if didn't welcome them, but they, it, in history, it says that they were, they, they took them to this atoll, then they took them back, they took them to another atoll, they took them back. And for a long time, the Bikini Atoll was uninhabited because of the contamination. It just opened up in 1997, but it's still uninhabited. It was open for tourists. And um, there's been testing done since the testing days, but the people of Bikini have been um, relocated to one of the tiny islands in the Marshall Islands. It's called Kili Island. It's very tiny. Um, the, the good thing about, one of the positive things about living on an atoll is you can go to the little islets within that atoll to look for food. Uh, you know, the islanders, people from the Pacific Islands and uh, any islander, you live off of the land, you live off of the ocean, that's where you um, get the majority of your food. So moving from Bikini Atoll, where there's so many other islets where the people can actually go and find food and relocating to a tiny, tiny island, you know, that you see so many issues arising where um, as the population grows, there's, there's not enough space for people. And with the Marshallese family, along with some, uh, you know, people from Palau and the Federated States of Micronesia, we are, um, you know, uh, extended family system. Like Beanie mentioned earlier, the Marshallese, they're also a matrilineal heritage, um, but it's, it's not a single family household. It's an extended family system. It's your clan. So as, as generations um, are born, that little piece of land becomes very tight and crowded. Um, next slide, please. So this is an aerial view. And this is the, um, a side view of the explosion. You can see they have some of the um, objects on the water. Those are actual chips from the war. They, place them to test how effective um, underwater bombing was. And so this is the Bikini Atoll. There's nobody there. They've already took the people to another um, atoll in the Marshall Islands. Uh, next slide, please. In Aniwita, they tested. So it took, I think, um, this is like right after war. And here, it's 1952. And this testing took place on Aniwita. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just showing you some of the um, photos that were captured from back then. And this is also on Bikini Atoll. Next slide, please. So this is on Aniwita Atoll. Believe it or not, people are living on Aniwita. And you see those dots? on the dome, those are people. That's how big this, um, this dome is. And it, it housed all the nuclear waste from way back then. They couldn't haul them anywhere. So they dug up the coral and cemented the nuclear waste in the dome. People are still living on Aniwita at all. Next slide, please. So fast forward to, to nowadays, um, there's been debate, you know, and I'm sure we've all heard of it, where um, there's the belief that there is no climate change is, is a hoax. It's, it's not real. The people of the Marshall Islands and some of the other island nations in the Pacific region are experiencing climate change. This is actually the Marshall Islands, um, Madro Atoll, which is the capital atoll. And I live near this area. 
um, these are called um, king tides, and it happens during the winter season in you know December, January, and they're very um, it's very real. And uh, these are very low lying coral atolls. We are at zero at sea level, zero sea level. And a, a little tsunami, it can just totally wipe out the islands. Um, and doing my, some of my research, um, Kiribati has already experienced, um, some of their islets have, have sunk because of climate change. And it's not just, it's not today. This was years back when I, hadn't been in Oregon yet. So climate change is really happening in the islands. We're at the forefront of that. Next slide, please. And I, I wanna, uh, before I jump more into, I wanna give the opportunity to, to Sandy or, or Beanie as well, if they wanna add. Okay. okay, can you hear me? Can, can you hear me? No. You can hear me or no? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay. So, so do you want to cover like Hawaii, Samoa, or Tonga? Or I'm just curious where I should start. Not yet. And I cannot hear you now. Not but. yet. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm so sorry. Technical difficulties, and and I thank you for being patient. But my name is Sandy uh, Sanyoshi, and um, I am going to be uh, talking a little bit about beginning about um, a Hawaii, the Polynesia, Hawaii, Tonga, and you know Samoa, and just a little bit about it. You know, at these at in these days, we're all looking at issues of Russia, you know, wanting you know, Ukraine, and they want it, and they're going to go after it. Well, it's no different from, in some ways, what America did with the Pacific Islands. Because Hawaii was a sovereign nation at the time led by Queen Lilio Kalani. And it was really, um, there was a seize, they seized Hawaii. It was a band of American imperialists. And they wanted to, you know, like grow sugar on the islands. And it was also an American minister, the USS um, Boston was a gunship from America, had the guns uh, pointed at the palace, the Ilani Palace, and they had 26 American, 126 American soldiers who were going to take over the sovereign nation. And Queen Leo Kalani at the time did not want her people to be harmed, so she, you know, gave in at the time. And to me, that was really, really sad. And some people think, a long time ago, maybe Hawaiians were all in grass shacks, but I don't know. If you know this, but you can look it up. The Yellow Palace actually had electric lights before Washington, D.C., in our White House. So, kind of an interesting, you know, bit of information. But I'm going to move on, and I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, you know, later on. I'm going to just tell you just a little bit about just the initial takeovers. Now, Samoa, another place, um, Germany and America didn't like the chief coming in. To so, what happened is, America will take the east side and that was American Samoa and then the west side Germany said they'll take that which was western Samoa which the name was just later turned to Samoa okay but yeah it's an imperial colonization and you wonder I mean I don't know how to believe they could just do that but America did now Tonga is really special because it has maintained its sovereignty and it's remained the only Pacific nation to retain its monarchical government, which is like really no phenomena. And um, people, uh, just to add an uh, interest, you know, another part of the Pacific Islands is Melanesia, which is Fiji, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and collectively a part of New Caledonia. And so, this is the part of the Melanesia side of the Pacific Islands. Okay, so. You know, all of us, unless we have indigenous roots, we all are immigrants to this country. And there are about 5,000 Pacific Islanders in Oregon, and they're immigrants. And unless your um, ancestors came from England, you know, Sandy. they probably didn't speak English. Similar to these immigrants coming today. Sorry, yes? 
Is oh, there? I'm sorry. So you, somebody said. Can you try to speak up maybe closer to the microphone? There's a lot of um, feedback. Okay, wait. This is feedback. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, hold on. Okay, let me see what I can do here. If I can speak, okay, is it better now? I think no. so. And Sandy, just is it a little reminder. better? Reminder. Can you hear me? Yes. We yes. also have interpreters interpreting on the line. Okay. 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 Well, I'll try and just put my face closer to the computer. Okay. And if you can, somebody wave at me if you can't hear. But um, I just think that I would like to say this to you because I used to do uh, my PhD is in clinical psychology. So I did war trauma work with Korean World War II and Vietnam veterans also. And you have to look at the contributions of Pacific Islanders to America. American Samoans enlisted more soldiers per capita than any other territory or state in America. But they cannot vote for the president because they are U.S. nationals. Micronesians volunteered to serve in our military at approximately double the capital rate as Americans do. So they have given to our country. I want to share a little bit about Oregon history in terms of the Hawaiian people. A lot of Hawaiians came to Oregon on the sailing ships. And so they did like trappings and different kinds of things and they settled in Oregon, okay? In 1846, the territorial delegate Samuel R. Thurston stated that Hawaiians are unwanted in the New Oregon Territory. And he said, this is his quote, as a race of men, as black as the Negroes in the South, and a race too, that we do not desire to settle in Oregon. So Hawaiians were prohibited from acquiring land grants, being naturalized or voting, purchasing liquor, or testifying against whites in courts. Many Hawaiians did turn to Hawaii. So that is part of Oregon's history, you know, the earliest with native uh, Hawaiians. So I'm going to move into, and um, Kathleen, I'm not watching time. So when you want to just go like this, or tell me stop, and I will stop. But I'm going to move into the issue that, you know, Pacific Islander students have developmental issues in their personal, social, academic areas, like all of the students. However, Pacific Island Islander students and their families and other students of color have additional stressors that they face coming to schools. And, and because they have difference in cultural values, because of their minority status, stereotypes, prejudice, racism that occurs with peers, teachers, staff, administrators, and then and the greater community. They do experience race-based trauma. And uh, when we, and maybe Kathleen talked about it, but the issue of, when you look at the research of collectivist and individualistic cultures, Pacific Islanders are collectivists. And um, you focus on the what's good for the group. What is good for the group? And that's what you're going to do. And emotions are more like... Um, experience as other focus and that's how they express it and it's to promote social harmony so in other words they would say oh i have feelings of feeling indebted to somebody or i feel connected to someone or i'm familiar with someone on the other hand european americans who come from indigenous cultures they view independent view of themselves right they are self-contained and out with unique dispositions, verbally really expressive, um, and they focus on, it's my right. And we heard a lot of that recently, right? It's my right to what I'm going to do, and not sometimes caring about others, right? And the other thing is, they express emotions are more ego-focused themselves. They affirm themselves, I'm jealous, I have pride, I feel proud of myself, which doesn't happen a lot in the collectivist cultures. In a North America, women seem to find themselves somewhat more by their you know, social connections. 
even with the you know European Americans. And one of the studies that really impacted me because I experienced it all the time professionally, when there's a positive outcome, um, indigenous cultures will say, I did it, it was me. If there's a negative outcome, the issue is it wasn't me, it must be you, which is very different from collectivist cultures where if there's a positive outcome, we did it. And if it's a negative outcome, oh, it must be me. So it's really different. You see? And this gets played out in schools and everything, your colleagues even, about what that means when something you know, goes wrong. And um, another stressor that I see, especially like in primary white institutions, is that, and I hear like, like examples from students. I recently had an Islander student come from Hawaii and here in Hawaii, you know, and Hawaii is really different. So she's a lot of different kind of people around her. But she is in a class now where she looks around and she's the only person who's different. And all of a sudden, she begins to feel less than. Her self-esteem goes down and she drops the class because it was like, whoa. And comments and things people were saying too. Really, she wasn't used to this happening. And so... Well, again, Yosef Islanders look different, and if they look different from people, they might be from European Americans, maybe darker or different. But you know, one of the uh, things that I think that um, I was at, uh, people don't understand who they are. So I had one of my students who's two keys, and I went to the Social Security office with her, and people in the back were saying she should be speaking Spanish, and so she was so angry because she goes, you know, I I'm two keys, you know what I mean? But people again, they don't know who they are. They'll judge you. And in this country, unfortunately, dark you are, you're treated to me more differently. And that's increasingly coming out more, you know, with the police and Black Lives Matter. Now, schools, teachers, staff, principals, administrators, um, if you want student success, we're going to have to look at some issues. Some of you have, might have watched Pocahontas, the Disney thing, and the Colors of the Wind. That song was so profound. The first words are, you think you'll own whatever land you land on. The earth is but a dead thing you can claim. Now, the second verse is, you think the only people who are people are the people who look and think like you. So when somebody doesn't look like you, it creates, again, again, this minority status. And along with it comes either the judgment of good or bad or who's included and who's not included. And again... So if you want to increase PI success, you must welcome students. People need to feel that they welcome and they belong and it's safe. It's an environment where they can flourish. And, um, you know, a, a name is a simple thing, right? But it's not. Um, I had a Marshallese, he was a, he was a friend of my son's and he said, you know, I feel bad because people call me Taco. His name is Takao, but they call him Taco. And I said, do you like that? And he goes, no, but they don't listen to me. So I told him, what is the girl's name? He said something. And he said, Mary. And I, he said, I said, well, why don't you just call her Mariah or something? And she's going to say, that's not my name. We who are come from different places have to learn the language and how to be in America. And yet a lot of work sometimes is not paid the vice versa. First away, I had another student, her name was Doreen, and she's from Hawaii. And her instructor organization kept on calling her Horen. And she kept on telling me it's not a Spanish name. And then I had an, she finally changed her name to Ren because it was too crazy. And then there was another student, her name was Kanoe, it's a Hawaiian name. And her professor kept on calling her Kanu. And she kept on re, you know, trying to correct him, but he kept on calling her Kanu. So I think that, you know, a name, what's in a name? But it's so important. My son-in-law is um, Spanish-Mexican and, and you know, but his memory, and the similar stories run off across many students of color. He said that the teacher asked, uh, what is your name? And he said, Carlos. And she went, Carlos, and wrote him a tag. His um, cousin happened to be half European-American and half 
Mexican. And what is your name? And and he said, Benjamin. And the teacher says, wow, that's a strong name. So how did he feel when his name was not met with a positive kind of comment? It had a major impact. It's still trauma for him, you know, that had happened. So again, you need to increase your intercultural effectiveness. You're learning, and thank goodness, congratulations to all you're here to try and learn about the Pacific Islanders. But it's most important that I hope that all of you will have training about other cultures. I mean, you got to know your culture first. And that's why implicit bias or unconscious bias training is something you need to go through. Because we all learn growing up from our parents, we hear things. We watch the media of how they represent, you know, a lot of people of color, and it's not always good. And those things get into us, and when we encounter somebody, those things kind of like take over us. And it's going to affect your ability to help Pacific Islander students, you know, other BIPOC students, because these tiny things that can be said can have a really negative effect on them believing you believe in them. And another thing I think is that, uh, I, I, for me, I think that you have to look at the parents too, who are also a first generation, they have the same cultural values. You know, it keeps them from raising issues with you as teachers, if you're a teacher. You're supposed to respect people in you know, authority. And they have faced you know, different treatment. So I wanna tell a, a talking story and sharing a story, because it's a story that's really in my, it touches my heart. My son is, I picked him up in American Samoa when he was two weeks old. He is Samoan, Chinese, German, English. And when he was in the elementary school here in Corvallis, I began to get these incidents that occurred. And here's, an, here's his incident. My son had played football for two years. The other boy had not played football at all. My son calls first down. The boy says, you cheated. He goes to the duty. Tells the duty, the duty comes over and says to my son, you cheated, you're out. This is differential treatment and it happened repeatedly. And so, you know, I finally wrote a letter to the principal and I said, um, this has gone on. I don't know if because you feel he's unsafe or I don't know. I listed a couple of reasons and I said, or is it because that boy is your darkened? has blonde hair and blue eyes, and my son has dark hair and dark eyes. And I said, whatever it is, I believe you need multicultural constraint. Okay, I go to meet the principal, and the duty is there, and I am not graduating. This woman with the most angriest face looked at me and said, she said, you call me a racist, I'm not a racist. And I was like, whoa, okay. So I pulled up the letter and I said, I'm sorry you feel that way, but this is what this letter says. And she did it again to me. And I was like, wow. I was thinking in my head, of course, I didn't say it at the moment, I did later. Principal, you should tell her to keep her mouth shut because you have no right speaking to me this way. How disrespectful to talk to me this way. And if I was a male, even, you might have done differently, right? So then I think to myself, this is getting interesting. So, okay, let me stick around. So I begin to talk about the, another child, that other child. And I said his name. And the principal said to me, you cannot talk about other children. You can only talk about my son, Christopher. And I'm thinking to myself, in a federal court of law, I filed a discrimination case against the Department of Veterans Affairs. I was on my own attorney and I won that case, right? Okay, here's this. But I can have to prove differential treatment. I have to say the other person's name at one school in Oregon. I cannot say the other person's name. So in the end, the principal says to me, you must come and talk to me. So I said, do you remember a couple of months ago when my son said, Mom, do you know the duty said in the gym? We are all Caucasians. And he said, Mom, he said it in front of me and Mohammed, who's from Somali, right? And so uh, when I said that to the principal, I said, do you remember what you said to me? And he said, no. And I said, he told me 
I said to him, you told me he was a nice person. And I told him, you know that some people believe that the Ku Klux Klan are nice people too. But anyway, for me, I began to look at the things that happened. The teacher then wrote me, the teacher in the class wrote me and said, he cannot do the science experiment. And the science experiment was, what boys and girls do for fun? And so we had a list of all the you know, games or activities that uh, children at that age would be involved And the boys checked off and the girls had to check off. And so I wrote to her and I said, and I don't do this too often again, I'm like, my PhD is in clinical psychology. I am a scientist. Where in your directions did you say you only have to do a general science experiment? And then she backed. But I began to think, whoa, something is not right, you know, here. So the next year, hit things were going better. And I asked the teacher, can you tell me what changed? And she told me, I chose to believe not to believe what they're saying about him. Because what? He cheats, he cuts in line, right? He does all these the negative things about him and it affected him. So when he, so when you look at behaviors across time and place, at the Boys and Girls Club, he never had problems. His European American friends and friends said, the parents say, oh, he's so well behaved, right? Okay. So I asked him, and this is what breaks my heart. When he went to the middle school, I said to him, how is it at the middle school? And he told me, Mom, it's better. Your voice is it, can you hear? going out. Your voice is going okay. out. Okay. So anyway, he, I asked him, how is it at Wilson's, you know, this school, how is it different from this Wilson school, the intermediate school? And he said, it's better, Mom. And I asked him, well, how is it different? And he said, I think they treat me for who I am. And I said, what was that different at the elementary school? And he said, Mom, I think it's because I was the only Asian Pacific. Now my son and my daughter were raised with all these Jedi social justice terms and histories. So for him to say that was not unusual. But it just broke my heart that it affected him, you know, and impacted him. And he never knew what I was, you know, doing kind of at the time, you know, on his behalf. But years later, he told me, maybe 10 years later, Mom, you know, I never told you, but that teacher was picking on me and the other students of color. And that's where I believe that I hope that you all as teachers can change that, you know, and can be welcoming and treat students equally. And so, um, uh, Kathleen, uh, uh, do, do I need to switch over? Because I'll stop anywhere. Is she um. on? I am on. Uh, I know we're uh, on. Uh, I minutes. know we're. He has a bit to add to that. Um, to add that. Then I'll stop. Yeah, I just had how to help just what to help all the individual students uh, with things, but we can hold it and this time later I can add that. Thank you. Yes, I think there's like towards the end we'll have a what Q and A with the student panel as well. Panel as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bini, if you have last minute, uh, Bini, if you have last minute to add. Okay, I'll close us out. Um, okay, I'll close us out. Um, okay. Um, okay. Sandy, she clarified a lot of things. For whatever reason, I'm getting a feedback back. So. Um, oh, wait. Perfect. I think that works. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, as you, as Sandy mentioned, and Kathleen also talked about the vast differences that um, are uh, Pacific Islanders, not only where they come from, but also the barriers and the challenges that they face. Um, I will just um, I think I wanted to add something about the Marshall Islands with, with Kathleen's um, uh, presentation. And, and I'm also a storyteller too. And one of the things when I, when I talk about the, the Compact of Free Association is um, a lot of times we in the United States, we, 
we've heard of the word bikini, right? Like if, if you've gone swimming, if you've gone to the beach, you've heard of the word bikini. Um, there's also a song about yellow polka dot bikinis. That's also a very common. And, um, and so to connect us to sometimes some of these colonial histories that we've had, a lot of times I tell people that we use that word without realizing that that's not an English word, that's a Marshallese word that was created because a French fashion designer um, decided that he wanted to create a piece of clothing that would blow men's minds. And now it's been kind of um, appropriated and most of the time we don't know that there's huge impact of some of these words that we use um, that really tied to our colonial history. Um, as, as also mention, mentioned, our students are constantly faced with alienation and being isolated, which is really an important component of um, understanding how they feel like that sense of belonging on campus. We are in, uh, in a school system. It's so important that we have educators that look like them, that understand their barriers. In fact, I was reading um, um, an article a couple of weeks ago, from, it's a magazine called Diverse, and they talked about Pacific Islanders being less than 1% in terms of teachers, educators. Um, so that's really, um, that's, that's problematic when you think about students not able, able to make the connections and see people who look like them because a lot of times if they're not feeling like they people understand what they're going through it makes it very difficult for for students to um to be able to be their full selves um, there was also a research done um in the university of hawaii around um um, the different types of um, challenges that students face. And they talked about humility and humbleness and respecting others. Um, and because of that value that Pacific Island students have, they might have quiet demeanors. Um, they uh, may be more in listening mode versus, versus questioning mode. And that's what Sandy talked about also. But it can be misinterpreted as uh, you know, being too self-conscious, not being interested in participating in class, um, sometimes even being misinterpreted as being rebellious, right? And so um, those types of uh, cultural differences really impact being able to provide the opportunities where we meet students where they're at. We really ask some of those challenges. Um, there's a lot more research around some of what Sandy talked about, which also includes that pressure to assimilate, that idea that we, we she talked about individualism versus collectivism. But a lot of times they are socializing only with peers from their own ethnic group. And, and it can look as they don't have the ability to go kind of branch outside, but they're looking for that sense of belonging and that understanding. Um, and that's important to be able to see that. I often found that even when I was a, um, a first year student in college, I was constantly, I was in a predominantly white institution. So I was constantly looking for ways to, to see how I fit in. And, you know, it was interesting to me because even in, in my homework, um, I was not able to connect to the textbooks, to what I was reading. And there were times I would go to my classmates and like, what is your example? Because all of these things have nothing to do with my background and I don't know how to do that. So when I became an educator in higher ed and we started talking about reading text from Pacific Islander authors or you know, connecting our culture to, and now I do my work where I actually connect many types of my cultural values to like cultural competence types of work. It makes it, uh, I, I think like, man, I would have been amazing if I knew this when I was a student, I would, written, I would have written some pretty cool papers and it only took me to, to be a senior as I was doing my graduate thesis to realize that 
the whole uh, like Palawan, um, we have a Palawan um, funeral process is literally a business plan. But I didn't know it's called a business like that those concepts were were literally the same types of things. We just didn't know how to name these things. And there was no guidance and mentorship that allowed us to do some of those things. So I'm gonna pause and just thank you on behalf of our, the rest of our panelists because we want to hear from students and other, um, other people who are part of this, uh, this panel. And hopefully if there are questions, we will be available to answer them at the end of uh, when the Q&A uh, section commences. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna jump right in um, because the most important people we wanna hear from are the students at South Salem High School. I know you're not all South High and um, I'm hoping that um, I can just center some data um, conversation in the room so we can think about the students um, we serve in Salem-Kaiser. So it is a small number of students, but a mighty and important number of students. And we so value what they bring to us that we have a number of positions like the one that um, Kathleen Jonathan is in now that Ken Ramirez was in that um, we work hard to support our students with people who can meet them where they are and who represent our students. So we know they're a small group, but we just take such um, great um, pride in who they are. And we've also had some programs where we um, help our high school students go into our elementary schools to have um, some Islander clubs and things. So we have some strategies, but students um, at the end, we really wanna hear from you about what is it we can do. We, the school district, we, the adults that are listening to better support you. So just let me give you a few highlights. So um, the first, um, the 2021 senior class by race and ethnicity, we had um, about 80 uh, native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders who were in the the cohort. Cohort means those students that started as freshmen. Uh, ELs, that means English language learners, 31. And the percentage of the cohort that is currently an English language learner is 38.8%. A, a and then we've had 55 of these 80 students exit from EL services. So at one point they were an English language learner with us, and now they've exited the services. And so about you know, 68 to 70%. So about 80 of our students in this 2021 senior class by race and ethnicity. Um, the next um, slide is about ninth grade on track. So this is really important to us because these are our ninth graders. Um, and these were last year's ninth graders. We don't have this year's data yet who are on track for graduation. And an important point is that our Islander students have struggled in the pandemic and returning from the pandemic. So you see this in their on track information, one of the lowest groups, and you can see how it's declined. We were doing really well pre-pandemic and our students were really engaged and doing well, but you can see how that's dropped off and that's a really important point for us. And we can still make the difference. These students haven't graduated from us yet. Um, and then the next one is the, um, uh, senior class by, oops, I think I talked about this slide already and was looking at the wrong slide in my notes. Can we go back up to the four-year cohort graduation rate? Um, this is our cohort graduation rate. So we're at about 66% um, last year in 2021. And you notice how that's back down. We, we had really good progress in 1819. Uh, the 1920 school year was the year of the pandemic, so we kind of lost a few students. And then in 2021, you can see the dip down. And that's really, you know, you can see the cohort size too, between 70 and 65 to 80 students. Sorry that I spoke out of order. I had two sets of slides going. And then um, now, if we could just go there, um, these are our ninth grade uh, on track students as of semester one, um, our students that are on track. 
So all of our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students on track as of semester one this year, we're at about 57%. And you can see them by grade level. So 67 at ninth grade, 47 10th, uh, about 60% 11th, and about 60% um, 12th grade. Um, really important also is to look at our uh, current um, ELs at about 41%. So our students who are still learning English. An important thing to note is we have a lot of newcomers that are coming in and they are coming um, with maybe two or three or four languages but haven't learned English yet. So they're uh, working to gain English skills and gain course credit while they're in high school. And then uh, finally, um, our last slide is around um, our regular attendance. And if you'll look at what's happened to school attendance, this is again, something important for us really to think about is only about 37.9% of our Islander students are regular attenders. And so what's that mean about what our students are doing and how they're able to get to school or maybe they have family obligations and they can't get to school. And we know that coming to school helps us give um, credit so they can be on track for graduation. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna pause here and turn it back to our students because uh, the numbers are important, but the voices of our students will tell us um, what we um, need to do and some things we um, can learn from. So thank you to our students who are here tonight. And uh, maybe um, Mr. Ramirez can find a way to give you an extra credit points or something somewhere. How about that? <laughs> All right. Uh, so with that, I want to turn it to our students. And I'm not sure how this part works. It's great to see everyone. It's my pleasure to present Mr. Ken Ramirez. He was in the um, equity office. He's now with Safety Risk Management, and he'll be facilitating this group. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, students. Hi, everyone. So we got three South Salem students and one North Salem High School student representing. They have went through a list of questions that they were given um, at South about a week ago, and they went over it at North. Um, they connected with their peers in the building to find out what are other resources or other things that are going on that the district could really help them with. I'm going to turn it over to our, our young ladies from South first, and they can go ahead and give you some of the feedback that they've gotten from responses from their peers. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Dara. Um, I'm from Chuk, and I'd say that one thing I feel like that could be like beneficial to us and help us is helping fam families financially. That's something that we struggle with at home. And another thing would be bringing other Islander groups together. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, hey everyone, my name is JLo. I am also from the island of Chuuk. Um, two things that I think that would be beneficial for us Islander students would be first is, I know through like a lot of students, a lot of students don't really attend school like that. It's either because they're, they either don't wanna go to class or it's like family issues, but I feel like every time they don't go to class, which makes them kind of not have the credits that they need, some teachers take that advantage of just letting them be instead of like helping them out of what they need. So they just let them sit there and let them, they just don't help out the students, which is really bad for us because we won't be able to graduate. And then another one is um, some teachers, like we can, a lot of Islander students, parents don't have degrees in high school or in college. Like some parents don't graduate. So it's hard for the students to know what we need to learn because um, our parents don't teach us, so it, I hope the teachers can understand us more, knowing that we don't know a lot of educational things for school. Hi, my name is Star. I'm also from Chu. Um, the main thing would be to be understanding that life at home is very different for Pacific Islander students compared to others. There are a lot of students that are in school that are 
responsible for taking their younger siblings to school and making sure there's food in the houses because not a lot of parents know how to drive. So it's all on the students. Um, I'm Angel, I'm a, Mar I'm a Marshallese and I go to North Salem. Uh, one thing uh, that I would like to say about the Asian American Pacific Islander group is, uh, I mean, what staffs need to know about us is uh, there's like a language barrier for some of us. And uh, uh, we just need you guys to know that um, patience is key because some of us are like, we're, <laughs> we're struggling with English already and with other classes that are, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. English is a tough subject. I mean, it's tough, yeah, it's a tough subject for us because we grew up in uh, other parts of the world, you know, like different languages. English was not our first languages for some of us, and which makes it harder for coming to America, like the Salem and stuff, or Oregon because it's like the population is mainly Americans and uh, the language they speak is different from us, which makes us, which makes it harder for us to learn for, yeah, cause the language barrier. So I feel like one way we could like, uh, you can uh, help out is um, send me more staffs that really speak our language and yeah. Uh, and to go off of what Star was saying, like things are different at home. Like when someone passes away, like for us Chukis people, when we don't just, oh, someone passes away and then we go straight to a funeral, we mourn differently. Like we take weeks until the day of the funeral to like get together, pray, sing, all those things with families and we have other families coming in and that takes a lot of time and we do that like after school like currently right now my cousin who passed away at our house we do those things and it takes up a, a lot of time at home so there's like a lot of schoolwork that I'm not caught up on and um like I try to explain to my teachers but I feel like they think it's an excuse but we just do it differently at home Students, thank you so much for providing some of that insight to us. Um, you've talked about some of your biggest challenges and a little bit about how um, we, our schools could help improve that. But is there anything else you'd like us to know about those big challenges and how we could maybe help you better? I feel like for because like there's all like there's different types of groups in the Pacific Islander you know group I feel like if like a group a specific group were to do some type of like um like the way they the way they carry themselves the teachers would think all of us do that but it just just because one group has done it they, they think we would all act like the, we would all act the same so they treat us all the same which is kind of not fair because like we haven't had a chance to actually talk to them and like get to know the teacher. Yeah. I'd say like they reach out and they help and they think that's enough. But for us, like you just have to keep on like reaching out and just don't stop because they'll just, you do it one time and they'll be like, okay. But if you constantly keep doing it, then they'll con like they'll get the message because it takes a lot for them to understand. Thank you. So another question that came up, I think, is kind of the flip side, where it's what is helping you be successful at school. So you're actually saying that when you have 
teachers or educators that continue to reach out to you and uh, ask how they can help or how uh, just how you're doing. That's one way uh, to help you be successful. And if there's anything else that would help us to know. Um, and also, um, let's see, what is helping you be successful at school from within the school? And then how does your family um, help support you in your school experience? Okay, for me, um, what helps me is I do sports after school, like, uh, in order to do those sports that I love, I have to have good grades and uh, try and pass all my classes. And that's that's just one way of trying to uh, graduate on time and stuff. It really helps me and affects my grade, my, uh, yeah, my grades, because it, it's something I love doing. And I feel like if you find what the other students the love, I feel like if you talk to them what talk to them about what they love it it'll it'll really affect them and their grades yeah and... um i'd say that parents or like chukis parents they don't really have an idea of how to help their kids because they don't have an educational background so they think like school is just something you have to go to and there's nothing after that like high school and then that's done and then you work they don't think oh college all these things and then all these things that will help you in the future they just think oh high school you just have to do it because you have to do it like they need more like because they don't know anything so that's that's what I think they need more help to understand that there's more than just high school Thank you so much. We're learning so much from you all tonight and really appreciate that you're taking the time to be with us. Students. One final comment. What would you like to see us as a school district start doing immediately to help you and your parents understand education and to help you be successful? I feel like if we were to hire more staffs that are part of the Pacific Islander um, community, it really helped a lot because looking around in every school that I've gone to, it's either a lot of um, Hispanics, Americans, and African Americans. So like they can't really relate on how we feel and how what's going on in home. Thank you. We sincerely appreciate you all and uh, you being uh, courageous and uh, able to share with us what you really need. And I know as a district, we are trying to meet these needs and this information really helps us and informs us on what we need to do differently. Christy, you have any last words? I just want to um, reflect back a couple things I heard our students say. One is that um, persistence in engagement with you, um, that one time isn't enough. If, if we could all do that, that might be one thing we could even change tomorrow. Um, and maybe one thing I'll take to the whole staff when I do my uh, next um, district-wide messaging. And then um, I think some of the cultural components, especially around um, death and grieving, I think was really uh, struck me also 
um, as something to um, think more about because I also don't know that you would share that with the teacher unless they persisted in asking you more. So um, thank you. And I think the um, other thing I'm thinking a lot about is language um, and the access to English when you're still learning, but you're strong in your native language. So that's another thing I'm thinking about. Um, and then I just want to say to our panelists, some of the um, historical context and things you brought into this space were really um, things I, I didn't know um, in, in every case. And I hope that our audience um, learned um, some things as well. So thank you for being with us tonight. And then um, Cynthia or Chair Avila, I'll let you close it out. Chair Avila. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was actually, I would like to actually, I think we're closing pretty early and I'd like to um, ask our panelists, I know I, I have, there's some questions um, online for, 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 for Beanie, if she could elaborate on um, some of the best practices to help students pursue um, and transition into higher education or high school trades after high school and just hearing um, the students share some of their experiences. And I love the way that the collectivism that Sandy was also bringing about that they, 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 they spoke and um, how, how they were gonna respond and what really was that and it's hiring more Pacific uh, Islander staff. Um, and then the struggles, um, the challenges of the parents uh, um, not having the information like seeing beyond the high school. Uh, so I don't know, Bini, if you're able to provide uh, some knowledge that we could take um, and probably help those students transition as well and help the families transition. Um, I, yeah, thank you. Um, one thing that I would, I guess, say in terms of the National Equity Project, if you're familiar with it, they use a model called the liberatory design, which is kind of what you're doing right now is really engaging in your stakeholders and letting them share their story. So we're not creating something uh, for a community, we're creating something with the community um, and allow them to be the, the people who are in so this space that you're able to, to provide to get the students to share some of those things are, are really important. I, I also was really glad that the students talked about um, practices for grieving because counseling services is not something that you know, we utilize like that our healing is that gathering and it, there's a tendency to say, we'll go to counseling so that you can move on to the next thing. And that's completely something different from and there's also stigma around some of these things because there's not a lot of um, understanding about what what they mean and how they benefit. And, and, and a lot of times it's like, like, I remember when I was asked to do that, I was like, this is a stranger and you expect me to go and tell them like how I'm feeling. Um, and so a lot of those things are, are really um, wonderful what the students shared. Um, you know, I, I'll just share specifically for when I did recruitment, it was really important to meet students where they're at and work with them. I, a lot of colleges and universities are, are investing in um, programs that allow for students to start thinking about college at an early age, even up to middle school and doing visits, but talking to students about what that looks like. And so when I did recruitment in the Pacific Islands and we did a lot of the, the conversations with students, we weren't talking about applying to college. We were talking about just what is education and social mobility. We were focusing on, you know, things around why education can change your life, can move you from one financial status to the other. But also we were talking about um, what that looks like as investment, as a family investment, and what that also looks like in terms of the student making the commitment. Um, we also talked about resources. Because a lot of times students, you know, every time you, when we talk about finance, it's, it's very much around like, what is the balance of your checking account? And so we had to really like 
disaggregate that and talk about there's, you know, food pantries, there are resources in the community that allow you to get rental assistance, there are, you know, services that you deserve, and, and really talking about entitled, like shifting the reframing how we talk about deserving and being entitled, because a lot of our communities who have been oppressed do not think they're, they're deserving, and they don't think they're entitled to any resources. And so reframing that mind frame and helping them say, you deserve this, that this is something that you're entitled to receiving so that you can change your life. And when you change your life, you will get into a position where you can actually impact the community and impact your family and help elevate your position. Um, so a lot of those conversations is really giving them access and information to to things that dominant culture already know, but we don't. And so reframing some of those conversations instead of like a checklist of fill this form, do this and do that, because that will come later when that sense of um, I am able to, I deserve, I can do this starts to resonate in a student and then into their families. So talking to parents about what that looks like, how do you tell your story when you're writing your scholarship essay? Because these students don't really know what that looks like. And they're intimidated because they're reading Shakespeare. And that Shakespeare is a language that they're probably not going to be using when they're doing English 101, right? They're reading a very different type of English. But that some of these things that they're being exposed to are things that are already making them feel like they don't belong. And so I'll just kind of pause there and give room for the other panelists to, to share what they think as well. Are you gonna go? No, okay, then I'll go. I just heard to listen also to the abortion, right? What I believe needs to be, Something that would need to be, you know, successful to help to be Hold on, Sandy. We can't hear and you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me better there? No. I think it's okay. How about <laughs> The light just fell. My mic or something. Oh my God. Sorry. All right. Can you hear me now? Oh, no. Can you hear me? Mute. No, okay. I'm sorry. Can you hear me or no? We can't, but it cuts out a can lot. Can you hear me now? We can't, but it... Oh, sorry. Well, then it's not. Um, okay. Sorry. Maybe I better just pass over because no, unfortunately, no. I can't even hear. Okay, I don't even know what to make it. Sorry. Okay. It's it's okay, Sandy. Um, we live we we live in this world. I'll, I'll add to to the Kathleen. Sandy, if you can mute, please. I'll I'll, I'll add the kind of a. Also, another question to Kathleen, but tying that in, um, but just to share with our with, with with our community here and the panelists, you know, we we had a conversation with um, some of our Pacific Islander staff. And it was great feedback, and we got to start making these um, and we got to start interactions. These, um, I have the feedback, and um, and going out to our communities and being able to get invited to that, we can start developing those relationships and speaking to families and our students and. And I really love how you were seeing that, Beanie, is how do we create that buy-in, those opportunities to really give them that buy-in so that step efficacy is, is there now and within the family. So Kathleen, from your perspective as, uh, as a, a staff member for the district and helping build uh, those relationships um, with our communities, um, can you talk a little bit about that and so we can make more uh, stronger relationships? Uh, for for the rest of our community and for our ed other educators 
so that we can be informed and start working together. Sure, thank you, Chair Avila. Um, as I'm listening to the students and um, other panelists, it's, it's really getting to know each student, um, each family, because um, each family, because I'm getting feedback. Okay. Um, it, even though, like, for example, as Marshallese, we might generalize like, okay, this is the way Marshallese do things. But within the community of the Marshallese, we're all very different. Each family is different. Each individual in that family is different. So really making that connection one person at a time. And it, not just to build those relationships because there's an agenda there, but really out of pure, just wanting to know people. Um, I read in Dr. Uh, Father Hazel, he's a Jesuit priest that lived in Chuk um, for so many years. Um, he's a historian, he's also a writer, but he um, talked about his experiences going to Chuk for the first time and really experiencing culture shock and spending so many years in Chuk and it came to really uh, understood the co culture, the people and became one of the Chukis. Um, and years later, he came back to the United States and he experiences, experienced culture shock as if he was a Chukis person coming to the United States for the first time. So he's, um, the point I, I brought that up is, you really have to get to know, like when your people are coming into your space, you have to expect that they they don't know everything. Um, but one thing that also came to um, as a during the pandemic, and in attending virtual meetings, and a lot of the time staff they expect students to to advocate for themselves. That's something that goes against the culture, because you are taught to um, not have an opinion as a, as, a, as a young person. You're not supposed to speak when adults are present, especially your elders. Um, respect is taught from day one. This is uh, for all the uh, Pacific Islands that I know of, like, you know, Chuk, FSM, Marshall Island. Um, respect is taught. And when, when students come into the school buildings and teachers are expecting them, to advocate for themselves, but they see a, a student sitting there being quiet, not participating, they see that differently. But it, it, it's a respect, it's a way of respecting the teacher, the students by not being loud and, and being outspoken. Um, so it's really getting to know the person because you want to get to know the person with no hidden agenda. Kathleen, can you hear me now or no? Yes, we can. You can hear me better? Oh, absolutely. Oh my gosh, somebody be told me to turn off the video. <laughs> How exciting. Hello. So maybe I'll do a few things and you know, that kind of important. I think it's important. I mean, everything that people are saying about, you know, about, at, and Oregon said, you know, we I did a lot of outreach to different communities, you know, the different communities, and we take students, but we talk about the very things that Kathy and I are talking about, you know, to getting students excited. I want to switch to um, some things to me that is a very dear topic because of research that I that I found that has so much impact on me. When I was in high school, right, my uh, math teacher, that one of the elders, told me to give up. I did it two times and. I just couldn't do it, right? So we don't need to give up. And then I went to the University of Hawaii and I started to take the math. And what happened is I was like, oh my God, I'm getting a D. And then I knew I was not partying. I was not doing anything illegal or whatever. But I was getting a D and I had a 1.6 grade average. Okay. And that's when I went away to Vista, Louisiana. 
now, now uh, what happened is after I came back, I went to a junior college. And, um, you know, what happened is I went to junior college and said, this math teacher is really good. So I took the math class and I got an A. Okay. And then after I took the math class, I took the statistics and I got an A. I had a 3.97 grade point. So what was the difference? And it was Claude Steele's work at the University of Michigan. He's African American. That really, really made all sense to me. For students, I really want to hear you hear this too. Okay. At the University of Michigan, the African American students and white students come in with virtually the same grades and scores. But why was it after here the African American students were the grades were lower? Said the Linux test. So he devised a matrix test. Handy. Yes. We're we're getting that cutting out again. Cutting out again. Again. <laughs> is there is there a way you can call in for the with the phone number within the email link with your phone? I I want to share something that I don't know if it's a process. Um, and I texted Sandy to let her know about the phone. Um, in I'm in the Washington State system now. I was in the Oregon higher ed system for about twenty years before I moved. Um, and one of the things that I was I found very interesting with partnerships with tribal communities as well as something they're doing is the same model that healthcare did with COVID-19 with culturally based organization. And I thought that was an interesting model to think about as, as we think about how to work with communities is, is thinking about culturally based organizations that have social influence within their communities and how to uh, kind of work with them to provide, um, to get, a better understanding of not only the, the, the communities, but also connect the community to, to the schools. So I, I, it's, it's something that um, Washington State is actually implementing now with getting some of those communities to work with high schools and, and K-12 in recommending scholarships, but also trying to diversify freshman cohorts by looking at more than just test results. And then talking about what that looks like. In I worked in, in, in Eastern Oregon when I work with students, I often talked about the limitations that rural students have to some of the things that our system requires for how a student gets into higher ed sometimes. Um, and that also becomes a barrier for students if they wanna get into a specific college um, that is competitive. Um, if they're in a community that doesn't offer or they're part of a, um, if their socioeconomic status does not allow them to pay for the extracurricular activity that allow them to really be able to have a wide range of experiences. And as we heard from the students, a lot of them have responsibilities at home. And so it's really hard for them to, you know, get into the band or the, all the other clubs or extracurricular curricular activity that diversify their resume and things that allow them to, to do that. So that was one, one thing that I know is 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 interesting, but maybe a new strategy that's been considered in creating that pipeline. I, I think we've um, kind of discussed that as well with Kathleen and other staff members, and I think that's very spot on the um, um, building those relationships because um, it's it's a community and. When our students, I, and I know exactly what you're talking about as I engage in that process as well. And so if our students are able to get that other additional support, that key support with, within their community, um, 
that they have that additional motivation, right? And those additional experts that can help move along the process and continue building um, success for our students. Uh, so very keen. I wonder if we are we able to get Sandy back on the line so we can start to wrap up. And if not, I love working with Sandy. Um, since the day I met her, uh, you know, she was able to inform, help me inform, and um, me on on students from the Pacific Islanders. As I am also in higher education professionally, and um, I bring her voice because she has so much to tell, so much knowledge, and so much passion, um, and advocates for all of our students. And we need more individuals like that and to continue giving back into our communities. And what we're the stuff that we're doing today, these community learning sessions, these discussions, bringing in the students, letting them know that we do care for you. We, we do see you. Care for you. We do see you. And, yes. And yes. Okay. Somebody said I shouldn't talk fast. <laughs> Was that it? Can you hear me now? No. No. Okay, I tried to call it and I just couldn't do it. It's okay. Oh. I really wish I could have finished the story because it's a good one for students and staff, but maybe I can type it later or something. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you for trying. We live in a technical world here. Uh, but if you can mute, um, and I'm just giving you thank yous and um, recognizing your your all your accomplishments and um, your contributions uh, to improving student success for our Pacific Islander students um, in Oregon. Uh, so I really, I, I learned a lot from the beginning, from the whole historical aspects, uh, aspects of, of the, the, the different islands from the testing, um, the bomb testing. And it, it just, I'm a, I'm a down today. I really am. I love learning these, doing these sessions because I'm just. It's like I'm I'm in a class and just learning that we should have learned when just like these students are, you know, we should have learned at that age, um, along with the uh, with the, our other communities. So I am very thankful. I'm very humbled um, by all you presenting today. I really am appreciative and thank you for the for the the guests um, joining us tonight. Uh, listening and again i just want to thank you for the entire team putting this together um yeah i had one keynote here um that i would like to share and it, it is students um need having our teachers need to be cultural awareness of the family dynamics um and understanding just the value of of what that means when we take a step to learn of their their barriers, the challenges, what we don't know, what what they don't know. We can't assume that they know this, right? Um, our students have other primary roles in the family that trump education. And we have to build a reciprocal understanding from our educators in our communities. How do we understand that? And how do we understand education is a high value, but there's other priorities, but learning the buy-in on how it can transform our families with pursuing higher education or um, skilled trades. So we got a lot of work to do. I challenge our educators, I challenge our board members to, to get to work and continue to build relationships and supporting our students um, and today for our Pacific Islander students. So thank you. Um, Superintendent Christy Perry, any last uh, additional thoughts or should I pass it on to Cynthia? You nailed it already. So I'm gonna let you pass it on to Ms. Cynthia. Okay, Ms. Richardson. This was an awesome session. Our, our panelists were just outstanding. You gave us some wonderful information. We hope you will continue to come alongside us and to help us implement these strategies that we need to do to make sure that our kids are successful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I wanna give a huge shout out to our students and Ken Ramirez. Thank you all for being with us. You all are awesome. And we will be working with you to continue to learn from you on how we can help you be more successful. To our audience this evening, there is a survey in the chat. We'd love for you to complete that survey. Give us the input we need to continue these sessions and to make them what you need in order to learn more about our different cultures, our different groups in our school district. 
Thank you, everybody. This was a great session. And I want to thank my team. Couldn't have done it without you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody.